Hello, everyone. I am um, Scott Holder. I work for Flotwig, um, which is um, we've been a German-based company. We've made centrifuge, been making centrifuges for over sixty years. Um, we have a pretty good experience with a wide variety of products. Um, today, we're gonna I'm gonna discuss three phase separation, and this applies to a lot of different industries. But I'm gonna focus mainly on the industries I cover. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen with you guys. I'm going to turn off my camera so you'll be able to see um, the presentation and not me talking. So again, at the end of the presentation, I will turn back on my camera for questions and answers. So I will. OK, so. Having said that, um, the topic of today's presentation is um, turning your waste oil into profit. And again, this applies to everything from hydrocarbon based to even animal fats and other um, oils such as olive oils and stuff. So um, topics we'll be covering today, I'm gonna go into real general centrifuge theory. This will be a high level, not a deep dive we're going to three phase equipment and features. Um, after that, we'll go into applications. And this is gonna be tailored more to, again, the, the industrial side of stuff, but everything I cover has, a, has applications anywhere you have three different, um, two different density liquids and a solid. We're going to process design and layout. This will be just in general layout, um, system layouts and designs, just again, for everyone's general knowledge. We'll talk about applications and keys to success and then go into questions and answers. So with having said that, the first thing we'll do is just give you a really good um, um, understanding relation to just different forces that we come in contact with and then how uh, the capabilities of a centrifuge. So. Obviously, everybody's familiar with one one G, which is one one times gravity. That's what's exerted on us in everyday life. Most of us have been on a center, uh, a, um, not a centrifuge, but a uh, roller coaster that can get up to about five G's. Um, the kind of max that we'll see is nine G's, and those be fighter pilots. Um, we're all pretty familiar with the human body can only sustain certain g's you know nine ten g's for a certain amount of time this is not a prolonged um, um, g-force that we do sustain um, in, in a car wreck which some of us have been in and and hopefully not everybody but a head-on collision can pull up to about 50 g's um, a centrifuge standard centrifuge mid-size can pull up to 3,000, 4,000 times gravity so it's a significant difference than what we're exposed to in everyday life, um, which will come into play a lot in our conversations. Um, this slide really goes into, um, this equation is called Stokes sedimentation velocity. Um, and, and you don't need to get caught up on the math or how to do this. But what this is really here to show you the forces that come into play um, for what we'll call sediment, sedimentation time or the velocity at which a particle settles on its own. So just a general rule of thumb, centrifuges cannot, um, if, a, if, a solid, if a solid in, does not settle on its own in a liquid, typically it's not gonna perform well in a centrifuge. So that time could be a week, it could be an hour, it needs to be able to settle on its own under gravity. Now, there are things we can do to change that, but forces that come into effect are the acceleration, which is what we'll call the G-force that a centrifuge applies. The particle diameter will also affect its sedimentation velocity and time. The density, obviously, the more dense the particle relative to the density of the liquid, the solid would um, settle faster and the less dense, obviously the slower. The liquid density affects settling rate and time and the viscosity of the liquid as well. So obviously something thick like molasses or a syrup compared to a, a solvent, right, or a, a water would be, there's a drastic difference in the viscosity and those will, that will affect the 
sedimentation time or the velocity. So there are a lot of other factors that come into play. This is just some of the uh, more prominent. Um, acceleration can be handled by a centrifuge, particle diameter, density, liquid, and viscosity. These are things that can be altered and changed um, due to uh, through chemistry and other means, which I'll go into later. So a real simple overview, two phase separation refers to one liquid phase and one solid phase, water, solids, water, clay, water, sand, water, anything. Three phase separation has two different de density liquids, i.e. oil, water, and then one solid phase. <clears throat> so the liquids um, can be a light liquid phase, solvent, oil, anything that has a light density, and then there will be a, a, a heavy density phase. In most cases, again, this is water. So this slide goes into um, something I think we're all experienced with in some, if you're running an oil recycling or oil reclamation facility, um, you know, this is um, hydrostatic, hydrostatic equilibrium. Basically, you take the feed, which is going to be oil and water. Uh, we're going to ignore solids for this example, but solids can be in this. Um, they come into the system. The light phase sits on top of the heavy phase just naturally. So the heavy phase will displace the light phase and go to the bottom. And you have a, over on the right, you'll have a barrier where the light phase can't go into, um, is stopped. Basically, it ends here at this barrier. The heavy phase can go under it and exit the system. And this could be a tank. In most cases, it is. Um, the light phase is displaced and pushed at a higher discharge point. So these can be taken off at different points. Um, if you're taking a tank and you're letting stuff settle, um, separate on its own and you're skimming off the top, exact same concept, you're just doing this manually. So one, this is important. This is exactly the same thing that will happen inside a centrifuge. All we're doing is just wrapping this around a cylinder. And so this slide takes exact same concept instead of you know height we're using radius um, and you have the feed coming in to the machine it is discharged in the middle the heavy phase goes to the outside which would be the bottom in a tank so you see the bottom here and, and the top is actually the outside of the um, bowl and you have the light phase which stays closer to the center of the system so on top and then you have a, a baffle, a weir, stopping the oil from discharging with the water. And you have a different skimming point for the oil to be removed from the machine. So again, the exact same concept um, that we showed um, in the previous slide, but it's literally just wrapped around a cylinder in two cups. So this next slide, we're going to go into just some general nomenclature or parts of the centrifuge. Um, there, there's a lot more of these. You don't need to really get hung up on remembering, remembering all these. There's, like I said, there's a ton more, but just for general discussion, you have the bowl. This is the part of the machine that spins. This was what will spin from, you know, anywhere from, you know, 500 RPM up to, depending on the size, three, four, five thousand 5,000 RPM. Then inside the machine, you have the squall, also known as a conveyor. This is, if you think about, um, this actually is a screw conveyor. So what this, this does is actually, as the solids build up on the inside of the bowl, they, this, the conveyor will turn at a differential speed and push the solids to the left the liquids will be forced to go up the other side. So you have liquid discharge, you have feed pipe, you have the feed chamber. This is literally opening in the scroll where the slurry is discharged into this system. You have the bowl, you have one motor that turns the bowl, you have another motor that turns the scroll. Um, this, is a, this next slide shows just a typical decanter. So this is two-phase separation. You have feed coming into the system, this discharge port, the solids start to build a cake on the inside of the bowl wall. The conveyor pushes it to the left and is discharged from the machine. 
the liquid phase is forced out the other side and it is pulled out through a discharge port. You'll see this handle here. This is a very key feature that Flatwig incorporates in its machines. There's two functions. On a decanter, it allows you to change the actual pond depth of the machine. I will go into that later, but this can be done as the machine is operating and turning. And again, I'll show you what the pond depth does and why you care about it. On a three-phase machine, exactly the same as a two-phase, all we're doing is obviously there's two different density liquids. And as in the hydrostatic example that I showed you earlier, there is a skimming point for the oil and a weir that keeps the water from, uh, keeps the oil from going over into the water. Now, this handle is here again, as the example before, this handle on a tri can will actually do two different things. It will allow you to adjust the pond depth like in a decanter, but will also allow you to change your interface layer where you're skimming the oil from the water. So I'll show you examples of why this matters, but it is, a, it is probably one of the second or third largest features of Flotwig decanters and tri canners um, as far as value to the customer. So this goes into pond depth. I mentioned it in the last two slides, but basically the pond depth um, is how much volume of liquid you hold in the machine. So um, in this case, a deep pond depth is represented by the top figure on the right. That allows you to hold more water into the, in the machine. It reduces the amount of solids that are in the machine, but it allows you to hold more water, giving you more residence time. So you have the force applied to the liquid and the time it is in the machine will affect how much of the clarity and the purification of the water. So deep pond will give you clearer water coming out of the water discharge. Now the solids are not going to be as dry, but if your focus is water clarity, you'd run the machine with a deep pond, all things being equal. A shallow pond will do right the opposite. Your focus will be, would be drier solids, less water in your solids, um, and maybe you're not as worried about clarity of water, you would run a shallow pond. Again, the adjustable weir plate in a decanter and a tricanter allows you to find the sweet spot that meets your needs. This is, you're able to adjust this in real time with your machine running. So there's no need for teardown, setup, changing of parts. The operator simply adjusts this, the weir plate with that handle and he can dial in exactly where he wants this material. So this really comes into play. A lot of, not many people operate in a static environment. So you're all getting in different types of waste streams, different types of materials. So the ability to adjust your machine while it's running is, is, is a, in my mind, a critical factor in, in as well as what we opinion. So this will go into the same concept of the, the adjustable weir, but this is for um, a tricanter. We call it an adjustable impeller. And without going into too much detail, it allows you to change the pond depth, but it also allows you to control the interface layer between the oil and water or the light phase and heavy phase. And again, all of these changes are, are able to be done while the machine is running. So here you have um, the impeller determines the discharge diameter of the water phase. Again, if you want more water in this system, then your priority would be cleaner water as opposed to cleaner oil and vice versa. This is a example that shows the separation zone that you could control with the impeller. So you can run it with a separate high amount of light phase, which would be oil in the system, will give you more resonance time for the oil, i.e. cleaner oil will come out, all things being equal. And if you run a higher um, heavy phase in the machine, water, then your priority would be, hey, I want cleaner water coming out. My priority is not oil. So in some cases that, that matters to customers. Um, it's a case by case. But again, the machine is able to adjust the uh, real-time running machine 
most of the customers will have literally just ports on the oil and ports on the water at the centrifuge and they'll take samples and they'll adjust the machine. This comes in, not every fluid you're gonna process is gonna be the same. Not, um, not always, your, your needs may not always be the same. So this gives you a high degree of variability and customization in real time. Um, typical solutions for this, most, most tri-canners come with this, um, but a, a Flotwig is the only one that allows, that has a mechanical device that allows you to just in real time and skim um, change your interface layer as well. So this this slide goes into a little bit more detail on um, goes into detail on the, the, some of the customization features. And when you're looking at centrifuges, um, the size and the components all come into play. But but one of the primary areas of customization that you that most people spend a lot of time on and probably will would be the wear protection. These machines are highly engineered and they're specifically specifically designed for the customer's fluid and application. So um, taking some time to look at wear protection is critical. So you're gonna have stuff that is maybe biological solids that there is little to no grit or coarse material in there. So you would not need as high a wear protection and in most oil applications, oil and gas, slop oils, UMOs, those things, you know, they literally anything can be in there from sand to bolts and, and, and nuts. So the customers will have these um, machines highly um, built for wear protection. So all the areas in red are areas that you can change, add, modify, enhance wear protection. Um, the inside of the bowl, the tips of the scroll can be coated with um, tungsten carbide tiles. There, um, all the discharge ports for the slurry into the machine can um, be changed or enhanced. The discharge port for the solids um, are all um, enhanced wear protection. Again, this isn't a. This could be a topic that you have a two-hour presentation on but it's good to understand and know that this should be and is highly customized for your applications. Um, so next is moving on to some of the um, applications you're going to see. And again, this is not an exhaustive list by any means. Um, and again, this list is really for more for the, the areas that I cover. Um, refinery slots, oil sludges, treatment plants, um, tank cleaning, rail car, tank bottoms and refineries, tank farms, oily waste treatment, um, off-spec oils, used motor oils, tank bottoms. Um, on the, um, we do a lot, we sell a lot of tri-canners on the um, um, uh, rendering plants and meat processing facility. They'll have animal fats in their um, waste stream. So we have um, a lot of experience on that side of stuff. And then, uh, you know, um, different types of oil production. So olive oils or anything, basically anything where you have oil and water that needs to be separated. Um, this can be waste streams. This can be processing streams. So Here's some um, just examples of what you would see with, you know, waste oils or tank bottoms. You're going to have Solids and you know obviously the goal is to get you as dry as solids as possible. Um, there is a trade-off between clarity and purity of your um, liquid phases and solids, but again that's something most people have a it, they have priorities and in most cases it's the oil they want the highest quality of oil. Um, we'll discuss a little bit about you know the trade-offs and what you can achieve uh, with that. So, so and this is. A, this is a hydrocarbon based example, but this gives you kind of a uh, raw material feed. And I want to speak a little bit to this because obviously the typical composition is not typical. Um, you can see, you know, anywhere 50, 60, 70% oil, variations of different amounts of water and solids. Um, centrifuges can handle a wide variety of um, compositions. But in this case, we're just going to stick with a typical one, um, whatever that really actually looks like. Uh, in this case, you're going to have some percentage of oil, water, and solids. The oil phase, our goal will be to get it to ready to reuse for whatever application or resell. So we're going to like 
the main concept is taking a waste stream or a um, downgraded um, um, commodity and improving it. So the oil phase, we want to get it to reuse and refine, where you sell to whatever markets it is intended for. Um, in most cases, the goal is to upgrade it. Um, water phase, we our goal is to get it clean enough to go to your standard treatment plant, PTOW, on-site facilities that can be treated with standard means. And the solids phase, again, you know, incineration, landfill, um, and uh, depending on the customer's needs, you know, with all hydrocarbon-based materials, sometimes it could be blended to make road base and another value-add product. Um, and typically what I see here is customers really aren't aware of what the capabilities are, and that's the real purpose of this call is just to let people know what you can do and um, when to kind of start looking at these materials as hopefully a, a revenue source and, and um, reduce your expenses and cost of handling. So this slide goes into a little bit more detail on you know, the, some of the numbers. These are general values, these are conservative, um, but you know, the sample, you have oil face and water and solid. So the oil, our goal is to get you um, below 1% BSNW, that would be one, below 1% 1 water and solids in the oil. And in most cases that is acceptable go, to go to market. Um, and then the water separation, you know, we, we, our goal is to have less than, you know, 0.2% and 0.5% solids and oil respectively in the water. Again, this is um, targeted to just standard water treatment um, the solids, you know, goal is to get and reduce your volume of solids as much as possible. In some cases, you know, these solids or waste streams are actually hazardous waste and have hazmat hazardous waste classifications. So um, the highest reduction in volume that you're actually disposing of it can be tremendous savings for, um, for a customer who is actually handling these ideas. So solids is really focused upon volume reduction. Um, so again, just restating the obvious, you know, the reduction in volume, you have the reduction in cost to dispose, which if you're doing incineration can be very expensive. Landfilling, um, you know, ideally is one of the better ways and the cheaper ways to um, dispose of material. Um, also just, you know, reduction in, in other environmental factors such as emissions to the environment, which is becoming a larger issue for, for customers who are in um, this business. Um, this is an example of just, you know, 100 tons of oil sludge from paint cleaning. Again, this can be anything. This can be daft sludge from a slaughtering plant um, or brown grease from uh, waste treatment for restaurants. So you have um, 100 tons coming in, you reduce to 10 tons of dry sludge, so that's a significant reduction. Um, 70 tons of oil that you could recycle or, or go to market with, and 10 20 tons of water. Um, again, this is just strictly to show you the potential. Um, each case will always be dependent upon the fee, which we'll go into in a little bit. This is again, just an example of oil processing. You've got the dry solids coming off the machine on the left. On the right, the test tube on, on the inside is gonna be the feed. So you've got oil, water, and solids. The middle one is the oil phase from the dry canner and the right one, the outside one, is the water phase. And you'll see a, a tiny bit of solids in the bottom, uh, way below 1%. But um, again, this is can apply to almost any industry. So a couple of really important factors to mention here about um, three-phase separation. Um, the first most important is that the individual components must be insoluble in one another, that meaning they are not, um, they must be uh, in suspension and not in a solution. So this example is orange Gatorade. Um, my example that a lot of people see and I get a lot of inquiries about um, is glycol and water. So the two are soluble in one another. Um, I wish we had a solution that, that wasn't distillation for separating them, but we really don't. Nobody else does. So, um, so as long as they separate on their own, um, 
and they're not soluble, they're candidates. So they must have the second major factor is they must have different densities, right? So um, to be able to separate through G forces, they one has to displace the other. Um, the heavy phase will displace the light phase. So if they're not different densities, they they won't work in a centrifuge. Um, the centrifuge can break emulsions and rag layers and all these, these different things, but the two fundamental parts for separating have to be different densities. Um, the last part is you know, gravity has to be the driving force for separation. Um, now we can, we'll talk about chemistry and some other stuff, um, but if they don't tip it, if they're not separating with gravity on their own, um, they're not a good candidate for the centrifuge. Um, this this slide here goes into you know some of the conditioning treatments. Again, I said if you know we can handle a wide variety of materials. Um, this is um, the title of this slide really should be process first. And what I mean by that is customers come to us and there's a process we have for identifying and and qualifying the, the, the potential for um, use in the three phase. But um, the first thing we look at is process. It's not machines, it's not equipment configuration or type size. It is what is the customer's process? And then um, what do we need to do to make the process better, make the process more efficient, um, so we look at all of these factors outside of a centrifuge. The centrifuge is literally the last piece in most cases that we look at. So um, conditioning treatments that we that are standard, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is probably the most relevant to everyone on the call. Um, heat, when you're separating, you know, again, this is going to be oils and waters in most cases. Heat aids separation. So if you think about, you know, cooler temperatures, the oils and will become more um, solid or the viscosity go up. So heat reduces um, um, viscosity, it aids liquid to liquid separation. So in virtually all cases, you are going to need to add heat. And I'll cover some of the parameters for that later. Um, another one is literally probably the second most important is water. We'll have customers come to us with um, 90 percent oil and five percent water and five percent solids and and literally um, you know they're kind of shocked when we tell them they need to increase their water um, significantly on the system um, so the, the without going into a lot of detail on this the water will actually aid in the solid separation um, of oil in the solids and what you'll have in a lot of cases, if you have too much oil in, in the reference to water percentage, you'll get um, the solids are encapsulated in the oil. They won't be able to move or, or, or come out of the um, uh, uh, oil phase as easily. Um, so and again, what we really recommend is, you know, in a lot of cases, is just recycling your water back to the system so you don't have to add a lot of water to your system and you'll just take the water you're pulling off in the water phase and run it back into the system and just recirculate it. Um, that, that is a very easy fix and, and I wish it was more complicated, but it isn't. Um, the, one of the other key features is steam and, and steam works really well because it adds heat and it adds water. So, um, you know, there might be some cases where you have too much water, but ste steam can be really um, one of the best things you can add to your system. Um, it does a couple of things, adds water and adds heat, but it also can actively remove the oil coating from particles. It can dislodge them, um, allowing the solids to come out. Um, and, you know, when you get your solids, you want as little oil on the solids as possible. Um, makes your disposal cost less and you recover more oil. Steam can rupture cell membranes. So if you're talking about animal fats, that can actually rupture the membrane and release the oil so you can recover the oil. Um, you know, if, if, if steam is available on a site, we always consider it and look at it. Um, the other thing, flocculants and polymers, 
Um, one of the, if you remember the equation at the beginning of the slide, um, it was talked about particle size and diameter. Um, so flocculants and polymers can um, basically bring smaller particles together, increasing their size and, you know, obviously um, adding more mass to the, the, to the um, particles, not the particles themselves, but the agglomerates. So um, we test these a lot in almost all cases. Again, you don't need them all the time. Um, it really depends on the customer's needs and their um, um, goals. But we always look at those. Um, coagulants are very good if you're wanting to pull suspended solids out of um, suspension and, and so I'm sorry, dissolve particles out of and pull them into suspension so you can remove them. Um, so flocculants and stuff, not flocculants, but coagulants can bring you know salts and other things out of uh, metals. We see that a lot in mining um, to bring some of the metals out of the um, dissolved metals out so the water can be disposed of. Um, uh, another one is, I don't see a lot in my industry, but the animal um, fats and proteins do, oxidizers, they rupture cells and that's really to get the uh, oil to release so you can recover it. Surfactants are really good at eliminating surface tension, so emulsions and rag layers that really help um, demulsifiers and you know oil and water. And then you know we can do pH adjustments, which a lot of customers are already familiar with and do that. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list, but the point here is we look at these things first and the ability and the customer's goals before we start saying this is a machine for you. Um, so this is a, a just a typical um, oil water solid separation. So most oils, is, again, this is tailored toward industrial, so hydrocarbons, industrial waste. Most oils, you're gonna to need to get them to around the feed going into the machine, um, 85C. Um, this is a really good number. Um, again, this can vary slightly depending on the customer's needs and the, and the, the feed that they have with slurry. But that's a good rule of thumb. We get, like typically always use progressive cavity pumps to, to stop shearing and, and um, kind of they can counter, uh, centrifugal pumps can counter some of this stuff we're trying to do. We're trying to put particles together so they centrifuge out better. So we typically always use progressive cavity pumps when possible. Um, target output is 65 to 75% solids in the solids um, discharge. So your water content will be some, some range in there. Typical oil recapture, we always shoot for at least 95% of the oil recaptured. Um, and then oil and water, we shoot for, you know, obviously less than 1%, as I said before. So a typical um, goal on solids coming out is there's no free moisture on the solids. That means if you pick the solids up and you were to squeeze them, water wouldn't come off. Uh, so these slides, the next few slides I'm going to go into are just system layout. Um, I'm going to go through these kind of fast because there, every layout and every design depends 100% on the customer's process. Space is always one of the key factors to have the space for a lot of equipment and, and tanks and whatnot. But these are ideal, they're not exclusive, and it's not, there are ways to minimize some of these things and go um, with alternate solutions. But this is oil tank, oil, um, tank oil recovery process. So. You'll see here in the middle, there's always an agitation tank. Um, centrifuges always like homogeneous feed. They can take varying um, solid water and oil content. They don't like slugs. So they don't want to go from, you know, 5% solids to 20% solids in a second. They can change and they can be programmed to handle variations and changes, but almost in all agi all applications, you're going to want a mixing tank. Um, here in the middle, you'll see a heating. Um, this, you know, customers add heating elements to the mixing tanks or they do inline heating, heat exchangers, um, steam injection. I'll show you one of those later. Um, but basically, we're pulling from the um, tank, going through agitation, heating into the machine. And then you can inject your chemistry in line or in the mixing tank. It depends on the customer and their setups. 
Um, you have a clean oil tank, you have a solids transport, you'll have a conveyor or some type of chute or a roll off bin that goes into, and then your water can go back to process or into um, back into your treatment facility. This one is a good one. It shows um, um, oily wastewater treatment. So this would be, in this case, we have an API separator. It's gonna generate sludge from the bottom and a uh, float layer. So you get it like a DAP system, but very similar. And so we take the sludge from the bottom that goes into a mixing tank. And you know, again, you can add heat if it's necessary. It, there's not heat in this example, but always assume there is. Um, it goes into the feed to the tri-counter. Then these oil and solids and water come out. Um, the float layer is also pulled off of the separator and put into the mixture that is done. This can be a standalone in, in animal processing, um, slaughterhouse facilities and rendering facilities. You can take this straight into the tri-counter with some chemistry and heat and get your oil separation as well. Um, over here, you see a decanter. You know, if there's not oil in the, or there's not a light phase in the um, mix, you would just use a standard decanter. This one is refinery slop. Again, it's going to be very similar, but you have your homogeneous mixing tanks and um, you have a direct steam injection, as I told you about before. You can also have heating coils in these tanks. Uh, then you have flocculent preparation over here. And, and again, a lot of these cases, flocculants really help your oil separation and your oil purity. The oil phase, in this example, we actually have a second polishing phase for the oil. I rarely see this as necessary, but it is, it is possible that you would need. So you have really fine solids in the oil that a tri or couldn't pull out. You can take the oil phase and go to a um, vertical separator or a disc stack. These machines can run at much higher G-force than a tri can. Um, sometimes double the G-force, which will allow you that extra um, G-force to get the particles out. They are limited on solids loading and some other drawbacks, but where you need a polishing phase of the oil, this is a um, very, very viable solution. This is uh, just a, another oil um, processing slide, very similar to the one before, heat exchange, heat rea heatable reaction tank. So this is heated tanks. Then they feed in, it goes to a heat exchanger to get the material up to the idea of temperature as it feeds in. Again, this is very similar to the slide before. Um, this is oil sludge treatment. We've done several projects with cleaning oil lagoons and, and whatnot. Um, so very, very similar to the before. And another key thing, which I haven't really talked about yet, but all of these systems and centrifuges can be containerized. So if you had, um, and they can be mobilized for rental units or processing, so you can move from facility to facility pretty easily. And, and we do offer um, turnkey solutions for that. So. This is, um, I wanted to in, put this slide in. This is um, what we call a steam injection. Um, this is a pick heater. So really all this is is you've got, um, this injects steam in line as you're going into the um, centrifuge. So you can bring the, the temperature of the fluid from ambient up to your processing um, temperature in one pass. So as opposed to a heat exchanger, this um, very simple piece of equipment, we use these a lot on the animal fat and rendering. Um, but there are a lot of different solutions out there for customers to, to get the heat and temperature and water um, to the right levels. Um, again, this is a very, very simple. Um, you do need a boiler um, for this to generate the steam. But if people have steam on site, this is, is always something we recommend and try to push them toward. So one of the last things I'm gonna cover here um, is um, our explosion proof machines. Um, we get a lot of questions about these machines and one, because you, we can build a class one, div one centrifuge, tri-canner or decanner. Um, so they have area classification, they're fully nitrogen purged um, the panel 
and the actual machine itself, the centrifuge is purged. Uh, we get a lot of inquiries, you know, obviously for explosion proof or classified areas, but a really large area that we're starting to see a lot of um, inquiries come from is emissions controls. So these machines, you can use this exact same setup to be a, you know, um, zero emissions machine. So they're purged so that all the gases that are inside um, can be actually cooled off machines and you can go through scrubbers or whatever you need. Um, we're seeing these a lot requests in refineries and other processing uh, facilities. They also are used a lot in food and beverage to, um, you know, uh, materials that people have that they don't want exposed to oxygen and other elements. Um, you can actually prevent that as well. So um, I'll go into one slide on how these work. And again, this is a whole entire presentation or you, know, you could spend two or three hours on, but real simple. We have nitrogen purged um, in different areas of the machine. The inlet, the outside of the bowl is purged. The inside, we purge the bearings um, through these seals. And short way of explaining this, the outside of the seal is purged at a higher pressure than the inside of the seal and the machine itself. So. Basically, half the nitrogen on the bearing will go to the environment and the other half will go inside the machine. There is no um, nitrogen coming from the machine going out. So again, if that doesn't make sense, I have an entire presentation on it. So the net, the net net is that all of the machine, no, there is zero emissions from the inside of the machine. Um, you can also enclose and purge the chute um for the solids and then the um the liquid phases can be captured and handled independently however the customer wants so when to look at these if you're in a classified area class one div one if you need to control emissions um, if you are um, want to limit exposure of the material to you know oxygen or the environment um, so And next, I'm going to go and just show you some examples of just different projects we've been on. Um, I'm going to go through these kind of quick just to stay on time and give everybody time for some questions. Um, but just a summary here, significant reduction in hydrocarbon emissions, 90% recovery. Um, again, I've said all these things. Um, this is a plant, oil reclamation plant in Columbia. Um, Lot with tri canners running, the people typically elevate them for solids handling, so they have chutes or, in this case, bins underneath them. Um, this is uh, Spain, it's a, a processing plant. You can see that the solids will have a wide variety of consistency. This is more like a paste, um, it really always depends on the process and the material coming in. Um, the structure of the material, if they're more granular or more clay like, you're going to get different consistency. So. This is another um, um, plant. I don't know exactly where this one is, but you'll see the centrifuge in a building above ground. This is a purge machine. Um, here you have the heat exchanger and pumps. You've got the operating um, control room and, and this is inside there. You, this is um, for chemistry, polymers and flocculant. So um, again, we can build fully enclosed systems, um, fully containerized um, or partially. So with that being said, I am ready for um, questions. So if people have questions, I am happy to um, talk about those. All right, we did get some questions and you might've answered a couple of these since they've been asked, but that's okay, we can reiterate a few things. Um, so let's see, our first one, uh, what is the advantage over gravity separation method? Well, I mean, gravity is uh, obviously what, what, what a centrifuge would do is reduce time. So we have customers that are literally, they have tanks and they're doing it for gravity. Um, your ability to expand is dependent upon how many tanks you have. Those are batch processes. So your process could take eight hours, 24 hours, two weeks. Um, so centrifuge reduces time, reduces footprint, reduces uh, processing needs um, and it's real time. You can process um, 
instead of going to batch, you could actually have a continuous process. And, you know, I understand a lot of people are doing batch processes, but really to reduce time, energy, money, um, and space, just off the top of my head. Um, um, is there a way to calculate your ROI on a tricanter? Yeah, no, those are absolutely um, very, very easy. And that's one of the things we look at um, with customers very early on. We do standard separation analysis. That's free of charge customers send in. Um, we, um, based on our lab testing and, and whatnot, we do, um, if we have all the answers we need, we can get customers quotes on a machine. We have input on energy consumption. We can help with um, heating costs and chemistry. So it is very, very, very um, possible to get a complete ROI. Every one of our customers does the ROI on the machines. And our goal is six months to two years payback. Um, that's including all your costs. So um, in some cases, customers can get paid back in, in six months to a year. Um, worst case, we really shoot for two year payback. Um, um, typical RPM, does RPM design vary with incoming solids, oil, et cetera, concentration? So I think, I think they're asking the RPM of the machine. So um, just as a general rule of thumb, the larger the machine, the lower the RPM the machine can achieve. But you also have a larger machine and you have more resonance time, meaning the material will stay in the machine longer. So um, slower doesn't always mean worse. Uh, so the RPM and the operating procedures are all 100% dependent upon the feed and the slurry that comes into the machine. Um, so, you know, it's not an answer you can give someone, but those are all um, factors that we test for. Um, after our lab testing, if customers um, are, think that the ROI is there, we do a pilot test on site. So they're able to see exactly what they're going to do, get the process determined. We send a trained technician on site to help them run the machine and get it up and running. Um, so, you know, I guess the easy way to say this depends, um, but, but those are all very, very um, answerable questions once we look at the, ma the material. And all material is different. Awesome. Um, is there no exhaust air at all coming from a purge tricanter? So, so yes, there is. So what we call them is um, purge machine. So you will have emissions, but again, the emissions will come from the outside of the seal. So you're going to have nitrogen going in on the seal on each end, each end. half of the nitrogen purge at the seal is higher pressure than the inside of the machine. So in a sense, you're gonna get the pressure, is gonna force the nitrogen into the machine on one side of the seal. The other side of the seal is just gonna be a loss to the atmosphere. So to answer your question, um, I think the answer would be no, there is a loss, but it is the nitrogen that is on the outside of the seal. So we can control and limit your emissions from inside the machine. Excellent. All right. Um, have you done paint sludge? What about when paint sludge is sticky? Yeah, so we, yeah, we definitely have done a lot of work with paint sludge. Um, being a German company, um, we're in um, several German manufacturing facilities, auto manufacturing, BMW, and Ingsum. So paint sludge, um, again, what I tell people when they call with properties, if you send us a sample, um, it very well may be possible to condition it to get rid of some of that. Um, but yes, we do work with paint sludge and that's a process that's pretty established for us. Um, the biggest issue I've seen in the past in almost all cases is volume. Um, you need to have a certain amount of volume to justify a machine. So I, I, before I even get into process, I really look at volumes with paint sludge. Um, so as far as stickiness, um, there are a lot of things we can do to handle that. Um, it, again, it really depends. Um, you, for us to look at a sample is free. It, and really all we need is about 500 milliliters of a sample um, and fill out a brief questionnaire and we can get do basic centrifuge testing to tell you whether it's a candidate or not. And then we kind of go from there. Um, so the answer is yes, there are, we do have a lot of experience in, in, in this. There are things we can do to handle that. Perfect. And thank you. You kind of answered the next question too. Is there any way to test if this is right for us before we buy? Yeah. So I'll go over that again. The process is contact me. 
Um, even if it's uh, people on the call, even if it's not an area I handle, I'll get you to the right hand person, but um, contact me. We do a brief discussion and, you know, if you say I've got 50 gallons a month, well, clearly there's not a volume. So it's just some real general questions we can go over. And then the next thing is get a sample to our lab. And in, in most cases, it's a pint, 500 milliliters. It's free. We do hydrocarbon or oil with reclamation testing, spin tests. So we tell you, is this a candidate? And if so, how much we believe we can recover, we show you. And what process um, we were going to recommend. And then from there, we have options, you know, um, to do pilot testing. That is a full size machine on site. We do charge for that. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, we have um, a lot of different machines that we send to customers in different sizes and configurations. So, um, you know, most people want a trial before they spend um, the full capital investment. So, again, right into the next question. So, how does the cost compare to other solutions? I would, um, so I would say, it, you know, if you have a tank that is on site and you can do gravity settling it's kind of like the same analogy when people call me and say hey i need to filter out this what are you using now if they're using sock filters it's probably not a good application this is uh, centrifuges are highly engineered highly sp um, specific machines that are designed um, to um, I equate them more to an aircraft they're designed to front they're built like an aircraft they're made the technology that goes into them is is pretty pretty astonishing so what i see um customers coming in if you're using very very low um you know if you've got a tank and settling works then it's probably not a good candidate i would say if you're want to look at new business a lot of customers will get hey i've got this type of fluid coming in and i think i can process it those are always candidates for just contacting me and seeing what the economics are but um, using sock filters, probably not a good fit. But if you're looking to save time, energy, space, throughput, go from small batches to a continuous process, um, then you start looking at a lot of factors. Um, I look for three or four legs to stand on. One is, you know, if you can get higher quality material. So gravity only does so well. Um, and gravity doesn't get your solids dewater like a centrifuge can. If you need to reduce space, um, a centrifuge really needs one operator and one operator can run three or four of these machines. You don't have to add head count. You don't have to, um, you just have to have a person that can be trained up to run this. So um, there are multiple legs to stand on. Um, you know, higher quality product, more products, different products you couldn't take before, but now if you look at a centrifuge, if I can process this, this material faster. Um, so also these are, these are very, um, these are assets. You buy them, you can relocate them, you can move them, they can be repurposed. Um, it's not a one, you know, it's not a, a filter pot, right? They can only do one thing and has to have a guy come. They're um, extremely valuable assets that can be repurposed, redeployed, moved. Um, and I'm not gonna say easy, but all these can be put on a trailer, um, a standard 18 wheeler trailer relocated. Um, you know, a lot of other filtration equipment and tanks and stuff, not so easy. So uh, it was a long answer, but that's kind of the, wasn't an easy, simple question. All right, I think um, that is all of the questions. Um, again, the presentation has been recorded and we will send out the slides and the recording right after this presentation. Um, or early tomorrow morning. So look out for that. Um, if there's any further questions, you can see Scott's information up on the screen. I'm sure he'd be glad to answer any further questions. Um, other than that, thank you all for joining us today and uh, have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks everybody for attending. Thank you.